Well, good morning, everyone. We know the pandemic has only exacerbated the recent trends of illiberal influence in the Western Balkans. Economically, the pandemic's toll has resulted in an average negative growth rate of almost 7%, which threatens to worsen living conditions, deepen economic and social inequalities, exacerbate migration and brain drain in the region. We know that Russia and recently and over the past decade, China have been engaged in the region, but the EU has been largely taking a back seat in the transformation that's been happening. Now, some in the region perceive the EU as a panacea still. Others are disillusioned as the carrot never seems to be something they can catch, eat and really enjoy. And there's fears that they may turn to other non-EU alternatives. So the big question this morning that we are going to try and address in some form or fashion is how can Europe address these developments in our own backyard and do it more quickly than we have in the past few decades? Joining me is our stellar panel. We have His Excellency Bouyar Osmani, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of North Macedonia. Uh, we have Gord uh, His Excellency Gordon Gerlich Radman, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Croatia. Uh, His Excellency Andrzej Logar, Minister of Foreign Affairs of, of the Republic of Slovenia. And Mr. Miroslav Lajcek, Special Representative for the Belgrade Pristina Dialogue and other Western Balkan regions. He's, of course, also the former Foreign Minister of the Slovak Republic. My name is Maitri Sita Roman. I'll be leading you through this conversation. Um, Gentlemen, and I would like to start with you, uh, uh, Minister uh, Radman. Set the stage for us realistically about where we are in the region in June 2021. We know that the region feels and seems as fractured as it was a few decades ago. We know all the issues that have been spoken about multiple times. But realistically, where are we at right now? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this question. And... Uh... You know that uh, Croatia, the Western Balkan, is in our, our immediate uh, neighborhood, and uh, who more than Croatia knows uh, the, uh, about the region, and uh, who more than Croatia is interested in uh, uh, stability, security, prosperity of the Western Balkan. Uh, it's not only up to Croatia, but it is actually the, also the European Union obligation to our uh, to show to uh, and to to be more proactive towards the you know, Western Balkans, uh, to have more concrete approach. The region needs our help, needs our assist assistance. And your question: Where we are now? We are very close to our Western Balkans. Uh, first of all, uh, you do remember the Croatia during its presidency. Uh, our priority was to organize the, the Western Balkan summit, and then also our friends, our neighbors, Slovenia is also going the, the same where we are left off. And actually, it is the, this proactive approach. It's shown by European Union and obviously also by the new uh, US administration as well. So we are here just our slogan was a strong Europe in the, in, in the world of challenges, and the uh, Western Balkan is one of a challenge. challenge. And we should just uh, to, uh, see that uh, Western Balkan uh, belongs to European Union, belongs to Europe. Europe. And uh, we, we, we don't want just uh, to put it uh, uh, on the influence of the third countries, as you mentioned on the, uh, your uh, outset. Um, so the countries needs uh, a European perspective, and we have to show it, and we have to to get them. Minister Logar, do you agree that is where we are realistically um, in terms of where we are at in June 2021 in the region? Well, what I see important is that that we are on a way. We are moving. So if I compare this period to two years ago. The countries of Western Balkans are again back into the limelight. So the fact that we are discussing here Western Balkans shows that they are back on the agenda. And I think this is, uh, it required quite an effort from countries that are in the vicinity 
of Western Balkan to put this back on the agenda. On a proposal of a few European countries, among them Croatia and Slovenia, we recently held a discussion on Western Balkan in the Foreign Affairs Council, and it was the first discussion after two years. And this commissioner again brought the portfolio of enlargement within the uh, College of Commissioners, which proves that we are coming back to the strategic question of the Western Balkan. This is as well one of the reasons why we decided to hold informal EU Western Balkan Summit during our presidency, to hold a discussion, a very frank and open discussion among EU leaders with leaders of the Western Balkan countries, where the main question is strategic importance of the region. Um, when we talk about enlargement with Western Balkans, it's, you know, a bit of false narrative because Western Balkans are within European Union. They are surrounded by the countries of the Western uh, uh, European Union. So we are not enlarging, we are just, you know, holding the grip on the land that belongs to European continent. And with this, one should have in mind that uh, European Union should be very strategic when talking about, you know, possible threats from the third party, which might not have the same strategy or vision for the region as European Union has, and for that reason, do its utmost in order to find the solution for, you know, like uh, failure of the reforms or a stalemate of the reform process in some particular country. So we think that we should come from, you know, uh, problem-oriented, uh, strategy to a uh, uh, solution-oriented strategy for the problems within the region. And this requires a change of the point of view. So I think we are on a, on a path to that. We are not yet there, but when we approach this you know, uh, goal, I think we, we will see the fast-track reform process on the countries of the Western Balkans. So I'm, I'm rather optimistic. Well, Mr. Doga is optimistic. Uh, Mr. Lajcik, do you, are you as optimistic? You just finished one of those conversations. <laughs> the tough out there. Well, they say that a pessimist is a well-informed optimist. Uh, when we speak about the Western Balkans, we speak about the uh, six partners whose overall territory is smaller than that of Romania. And we speak about the uh, six partners is, whose accumulated GDP is approximately similar to the one of Slovakia. We speak about a region that uh, uh, has 70% uh, of its trade with the European Union and who receives 60% of its investment from the European Union. We speak about a relationship that is extremely strong. European Union provided 3.3 billion euros to help the region fight with pand pandemics. European Union recently presented 9 billion euro plan, economic and investment plan for the region. We speak about the region where the support for the European integration is 80% uh, on, on average. So it should be a happy partnership, but it's not. And that's the problem. The problem is that, uh, first of all, what we do, what we as EU do for the region is basically taken for granted. Uh, you have partners who receive 200 million euro a year in grants, and they will tell you EU is doing nothing for, for me and for my country. We are also, EU has never been good at being uh, quick. So, for example, uh, with vaccines, when the partners needed a, a quick assistance, it was not us who came first. Obviously, and overall, and six months from now, we will see that the European Union has provided by far the highest amount of vaccines. But when it was most needed and most visible, it was not happening. It was the Russians, it was the Chinese. It was the Serbs, actually, also. But the most important dilemma is whether the promise of their future membership in the European Union still stands. And uh, there are some of the EU member states who have their doubts, and, uh, and uh, our part partners are also questioning 
whether it's worth to go into all these reforms when the outcome is not so no, well known and when the goalpost seems to be moved further away and Boyar will say something about it and the, the vision becomes more blurred. And this is the dilemma we are in right now and the sooner we find answers to this dilemma, the better for us, for the EU and for the region. Mr. Osmani, that brings me nicely back to you. Um, one of those countries is North Macedonia. Um, it's been years and years of trying to meet the accession rules um, and the goalpost, as Mr. Lajcik says, keeps moving. Realistically, what, what is the position internally in Northern Macedonia about the EU? Is it, is it an attractive proposition anymore? <clears throat> well, thank you so much. First, I'm the only one from Western Balkans here. Uh, we don't like very much the name Western Balkans. We would like to have some European prefix in uh, front of it, so uh, Southeastern Europe would be better sort of it gives us more confidence that uh, we're going there. Uh, Anja said that uh, the fact that we are talking about Western Balkans, we are meeting more often, tells that the Western Balkans is on the agenda. I will try to give another perspective. Uh, you have probably noticed that there is an intensified communication lately between EU and Western Balkans. It started in Bordo Brioni with a summit, Tirana summit, Vienna summit, uh, Berlin process, PRESPA forum dialogue. And my feeling is that this intensified communication tells that there is a widespread feeling that the region is reaching a critical point, some critical point. And I think that that critical point uh, is the loss of confident, confidence in the credibility of the European perspective. And uh, the turning point to go beyond that, uh, uh, losing that confidence is the unique case of North Macedonia. North Macedonia has started this journey 20 years ago signed the Stabilization Association Agreement in 2001 after Slovenia, a few months before Croatia. Just to put it in a context, Croatia this year marks eight years of its membership. We have not started yet the accession talks to join EU. In the same year, we signed the Ohrid Framework Agreement, which provided the frame to build a functional multi-ethnic democracy. And today, 20 years later, this Ohrid Framework Agreement is considered as the only, or if I don't exaggerate, as the most successful peace agreement in the ex-Yugoslavia territory. Because it built, a, it tell that uh, functional multi-ethnic democracy can work in the Balkans, and it can serve as a model for the region and beyond the region. From 2005, we were granted the status of candidate. From 2009, 11 consecutive recommendations from the Commission that we have fulfilled the criteria to start accession talks and they were refused every single time in the Council due to bilateral issues. So we came up to 2018 when we signed the PRESPA agreement. We changed the name of the country, we changed the constitution due to this ambition to join EU. We signed the friend, uh, Good Neighbourless Treaty with Bulgaria, so we accepted shared and common history and accepted a reciprocal bilateral clause on the language, so issue at the, uh, with core sensitivity for the identity of people, and we are still not there. And there's a feeling in North Macedonia that uh, this is a moving target, that there is no credibility in the, in the process. And why, why is critical? It is critical because this process was based on conditionality, on the, the sentence which is very popular in, North, in the Balkans, if you deliver, we will deliver. And this sentence was the main fuel for the engine, of uh, the reform engine in the region. But most importantly was the glue for the contradictory narratives in the region that were sometimes conflicting narratives. Mm -hmm. And this EU narrative sort of subordinates and keeps them uh, together. And as this uh, glue and this fuel weakens, the engine of reforms will slow, yep. the conflicting narratives will detach and go into some kind of uh, entropy. And we come to the third question, what, is, what needs to be done? I think the accession talks, starting the accession talks is the solution. Accession talks is nothing more than a, a technical assistance for the countries. 
So EU need to adjust anything to, to provide the accession talks, but rather to assist the countries to develop in complementarity with the region. And I will tell something that maybe we don't say it often. We are aware that we might not join EU in this setting as it is now. Our idea is that while EU reform itself and get ready to accept new countries, and while the region prepare itself to be ready to get in, we need some kind of hook so we don't diverge. We grow into different directions due to dragging and pushing forces from external forces, from internal forces, and we, we never meet. So the idea of accession talks is to grow together, hand in hand, in parallel. And sometime when Europe will be ready to accept us, we would be ready to, uh, to, to, to join. And I think that the case of North Macedonia has become a litmus test for this credibility, and June will be the first opportunity for EU to respond to this uh, unique case. So, gentlemen, I'll put it to you. Um, what is the carrot? for North Macedonia and the others at this point, if um, the EU, as you say, Mr. Lajcik, is slow, and the, and the Chinese and the Russians, the Saudis, the UAE, pretty much Turkey, name, name, name the country, and you have a circle uh, of uh, people just trying to figure out who can get the influence in that region. What is the carrot that the EU can offer speedily, which we're not known for? Uh, <clears throat> I, I would love to put it to all of you. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much. But uh, before answering your question, uh, really, I fully agreed with uh, uh, Boyar, my good friend. Uh, what he said, actually, the Western Balkans uh, was really imposed and not asking the, the countries if they are really un, uh, agreed with this name. It is something that uh, it is arti artificial. Uh, it's uh, neither uh, politically nor geographically correct if there is the Western Balkan with the eastern part. However, it's uh, more appropriate, a proper, proper uh, Southeast Europe. But however, it's so uh, where we are now, okay? It's Southeast Europe or the Western Balkans. However, uh, during the creation of your presidency last year, uh, our success or the outcome of the uh, uh, Western Balkan summit was the so-called Zagreb de Declaration, and we were so happy to, uh, to give uh, the European, uh, to hand over actually the, the optimism and, and, and good message to uh, Northern Macedonia and Albania, uh, meaning that so we actually opened uh, the uh, according, based on the, the, on the new uh, methodology, to accession negotiation with Northern Macedonia and, and Albania. And, uh, so uh, we look forward just in the, to start with the ne negotiation. It's uh, also creation position uh, without further delay with North Macedonia because they deserved really they, they suffered so almost uh, 16 years and so they finally agreed. It was only one criteria or condition uh, to change the name and its outcome of this. In, uh, uh, so long uh, term uh, uh, negotiation uh, and I think so the European Union should decide on this matter and to start the negotiations with, uh, with North Macedonia and Albania because the country wants to be part of the European Union they uh, fulfilled uh, many of criteria like Croatia did so we know that we, uh, we, wor we worked also, we have been working even, even more on that, uh, together and we know actually where they are now on, on uh, what they, uh, they reached really and uh, they, they made a, a big progress. And it will be, an, uh, so it's up to European Union to show the strength and to show really readiness to start a negotiation with North Macedonia and Albania. What's the carrot, gentlemen? What is the carrot at this point? It's not about the carrot. It looks like uh, we are holding the carrot and uh, our partners from North Macedonia are coming to us and we are running away from them. Mm -hmm. And the carrot is uh, rotting in the meantime. So this is the problem. With North Macedonia, we have a, a, a unique partner who has done everything we've ever asked them to do. And the ball is clearly in our court. And the North Macedonian case is a test of our credibility. Because 
It's easy to blame our partners, but they don't give us the luxury to blame them. So we need to sort it out. If we, if we are serious and if we want to be seen as credible partners for, for, for the Balkans, and not only the one who supplies money, but uh, uh, is unable to influence the development. And for me, this is not about North Macedonia's European future. It's also about U European Union's credibility as a global player. It's about our ability to influence, uh, in a European way, our immediate neighborhood. It's about our, our ability to be partner to the United States, for example. If we cannot act as a, as a strong actor in the Balkans, where else are we expected to play a, this role? So that means if we fail in the Balkans, we have failed as a global actor, as a, as a foreign policy player, as the European Union. So this is what we... Because there are some among us who think that Membership perspective is some, some, a gift from us. It's one-way street, something we give to the region. No, it's an investment that will, of course, bring us very strong, powerful return to us from the region, but also wider. Mr. Logar, how do you convince uh, those within the EU who are still unconvinced? Um, Bulgaria, for example, uh, when it comes to this particular issue, or other countries who are still reticent to back the accession? How do you do it? I mean, you've, you guys have tried. Well, if it was so simple, we wouldn't discuss it here. Oh, there you go. Give we me a solution. We would already be starting negotiation with the European Union. You, uh, regarding the question, what's the carrot? I completely agree with uh, Miroslav. What might be a carrot is the European way of life. I mean, why they want to join European Union. It's because living standards are high. That's the community that's based on the rule of law. And we know how, you know, well advanced how the procedure are taking place. And this is the question of the credibility of the European Union. So we settled the rules, now we have to fulfill the rules. We have to be accountable on the rules we put forward. So um, this is the question of 27 more than the question of Republic of North Macedonia. And we will have to solve it within us. Um, but as I said, European Union is based on the rule of law and we have a very strict decision-making process that requires unanimity and unless we have all on board, we have no decision taken. So from that on, it's the question of the di diplomacy, how we do it. And now this question of IGC, inter intergovernmental conference, is at the cradle of everything now. So this is the main issue. Everything is focused on this. You know, it, it reminds me like when you have a small stone and you have a fence with a, a lot of, you know, free space and some sticks it in. And when you throw it, I mean, almost every time you catch the, the stick, not the empty space. Why? Because you automatically focus yourself on the target. And it seems like you here, when we all focus on IGC and everything is concentrated on the IGC, but IGC is just, you know, like... <laughs> procedural step forward of the political decision that was already adopted in March 2020. So, it's not everything start and stop now, but it's just, you know, a passage in the process that will take some time. And I think that the, 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 the task of the more di diplomacy now is how to overcome now this focus and start to talk about the real issue. So, how to reform on their own, the system of North Macedonia, an order that will fit for European Union uh, system. And, and this is in benefit of fellow citizens of, of Buyar, in order they will get uh, the most of it. The, the membership will be just, you know, final phase when we will all say, yeah, I mean, they fulfilled everything and he's one of us. Uh, well, while I wait for uh, someone backstage to bring me uh, the online uh, audience's questions um, and the tablet that requires me to um, read it out, I'd like to open the floor to all of you for your questions. Uh, we, of course, have um, all of our mic handlers with, uh, with the mics. If you have a question, please raise your hand, name, organization, and a question. If I can start with the gentleman here on my right. Um, in the front row, and then if I can get a question from the person at the back and here in the front as well. So first person. 
Mr. Ministers, thank you for uh, interesting points raised here. I'm Mirakli Gavidashvili from the University of Glasgow, representing South European Studies Programme. So we include the Western Balkans in Southeast, Southeast Europe at our university. My question is that um, although the Skopje and uh, Sofia are the closest capitals in the European Union, uh, both remain uh, pretty much disconnected uh, in Europe. There is neither a direct, uh, for instance, direct uh, railway system or nor a highway connecting the th two countries. How the European Union sees itself uh, in connecting or bridging the two nations? Because there are impending issues which uh, derail the start of the uh, uh, accession negotiations. Thank you. Who wants to take that? This is well, for me? Yeah. yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, this is true. From Skopje to Sofia, there are 200 kilometers average. From Skopje to Tirana is the same, 200 kilometers. But to drive from Skopje to Sofia, you need five hours. And this is bad. Bad for people-to-people -people contact, bad to, uh, for businesses. Uh, but infra connectivity was at the core of Berlin process. Connectivity is at the core of the new investment, regional investment plan that was mentioned here by a special representative of 9 billion with additional 20 billion of, uh, uh, of cheap loans. So we are working on that. The bilateral treaty that we signed with Bulgaria in 2017 was a turning point in our relations. The main uh, pages of this agreement are about sectorial cooperation. Unfortunately, the impediments are in the uh, historic and identity issues, but the agreement is about expanding sectorial cooperation. And we are working on, uh, on that. Uh, we are working on the railway, which is part of Corridor 8 that links Skopje to Sofia. Uh, 120 million are grant from uh, pre-accession funds, and the rest is uh, a loan from EBRD, and the dynamic is, uh, is, going, uh, is going well. The same is happening on the, uh, on the highway. So this is the future, and it's important that we continue to focus on connectivity and uh, infrastructure. We have a question, before I go back to the audience, from um, our online audience. Nanad brings up the question of China, uh, which we can't avoid. Um, asking how will China's growing presence in the Western Balkans affect uh, the region in economic, environmental and other terms. Um, I know a number of experts will say that it is largely exaggerated in terms of the n amount of infrastructure and amount of investments that have come in. A lot of promises made, a lot of deals announced, but um, it kind of fizzles out at the end of the day. Um, where do you see this? Um, if I can start with you, Mr. Leitchuk. Um is China's influence something to be exceedingly concerned about, and will it change the region? I am not worried about the uh, presence and activities of uh, so-called third actors in the region. First of all, we do not own the Western Balkans. It's legitimate that other countries uh, are interested. Uh, we know that uh, no one has an offer that can beat the offer from the European Union. Uh, there are examples of uh, Chinese investments in the region, and these are not happy e examples. Go to Montenegro and ask them about the, about the project of the highway and the loan. Uh, there are other projects. Clearly, uh, the, 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 the financial conditions of, of, of their loans are way more difficult and less beneficial than the, one, the ones from the European Union. Uh, so, uh, as I said, the, the region is already embedded in the European economic and financial uh, space. So this is not a, this is, this is not a worry. What, what, what is our worry is to complete the integration, the political integration of the Western Balkans. And then, of course, the, the region is open to, to uh, any other countries, but uh, I, I think, the, as I said, the competition will clearly shows and already shows that the European, uh, European cooperation is the best cooperation they can have. Would you all agree with that? that China's influence is nothing to worry about, including attempts to, you know, buy media companies, etc. Yeah, I fully agree then, uh, with Mr. Leczak. Actually, it, it's to some extent a methodology. Uh, methodology. Um, we, we should just you know, to uh, to respect uh, the the fact that so China is not enemy, but we, we should uh, see uh, and uh, China as as a partner. 
and to, to, to build among the European Union. However, a partnership, of course, with, with, uh, with China based on the rule of law, of course, competition, actually uh, based on the European uh, values. Uh, I'm, I don't, also don't see that so that the influence of China in the Western Balkan is so that so it's something that should uh, worry us in, in uh, among the European Union. Although all the Chinese also um, sometimes on the agenda of the of the Council of the European Union, uh, but of course um, there we have to uh, to have a um, uh, economically or uh, politically, of course that uh, it's in a part of the uh, uh, world order. China is the fact, and, uh, but it's something that uh, it's not so their influence like it's going to be shown there, uh, in, the, in, the Europe, uh, in, in Europe, in the world. Um, so there is, of course, there is in a format so-called uh, 16 plus or 17 plus one, but uh, so uh, every country has an uh, uh, of course, and the connections with, with China and China uh, helped us also during the, the uh, pandemic uh, uh, crisis. It should not have been uh, forgotten also the, 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 the Chinese role uh, in this very, very difficult time. You know, that so uh, actually we are, uh, the pandemic uh, 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 crisis uh, forced us to adapt to the new reality and uh, we, 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 we were just in a, uh, we are. We tried to find a common solution, and uh, of course, uh, there, uh, China was also part of, of this solution. Mr. Well, when it comes to external factors, I'm more worried about their impact through soft power on uh, ideological, cultural, and religious basis, through from Moscow to to Middle East, rather than economic and financial incentive. Uh, and also through hybrid threats and uh, attempts to permanently keep uh, the region into a destabilization uh, mode. Financially, as uh, Mr. Lychak said, uh, the offer from third parties is uncomparable to the one that we have with the EU. We are, as it was said, an island surrounded by EU and NATO member states. Our economy, 85%, is linked with EU. It's 10%, 10 to 15% within the region, and it's only 1% with Russia or China. So uh, I don't see it as a threat. The first phase of attempts through, through loans in infrastructure failed. In North Macedonia, the main highway that was financed through Chinese loan failed. I think it's causing a problem in Montenegro, and this is, is creating a, a, an inhibition to further uh, continue with this. So I would put emphasis on these two aspects, uh, cultural influence and hybrid, uh, hybrid threats. Mr. Loga? You you know, I'll, I would separate this question from the topic we discussed before, this um, enlargement process where um, European Union got its, gave its promise and now should stick to the promise. Now we are talking about the other side, so the countries of the Western Balkans. Before they are entering the European Union, they are, you know, free countries, they decide on their own. But as well, with their decision, it's their policy mix they are showing. So if their decisions are in complete, um, let's say, opposite side as a, a foreign security policy decision of the European Union, well, I see this as a problem, yeah, for sure. And if someone wants to join and become a member of European Union, that it's, uh, uh, let's say, based on the rule of law and uh, common principles, I guess it has to show as well with its decisions within the, you know, this geostrategical pool of political decisions. So uh, one, ne one cannot just, you know, easily uh, throw away the, the question of the possibility of third parties entering the region, but it's not the sole responsibility of European Union. It's as well responsibility of the countries of the Western Balkans. But in order to have them on board, as I said, the precondition is that the European Union sticks to its promises. So everything is interconnected, but both parts 
bears its share of their policy making. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I would like to take a question from the gentleman in the middle seat here, please, and then move on. Um, good afternoon. My name is Samir Beharic. I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm here with the um, Globsec Young Leaders Cohort. Um, I'm Honestly, a bit surprised and, and disappointed that there are no more Western Balkan representatives here on the, um, on the panel, including, for example, representatives from um, Kosovo, who cannot, whose citizens cannot move freely throughout Schengen area, which is another issue I would like to emphasize here. I'm here with 10 of my colleagues from the region. We should have been 12. However, two of our friends, colleagues, could not travel from Kosovo in Schengen because of um, visa liberalization problems. So my question here is, when is EU going to enable visa-free travel for um, Kosovo citizens? Because again, the Kosovo government has delivered. In this case, the EU has not delivered on its promise. And I'm not asking this only because of my Kosovo friends. I'm asking because of why should my country officials, corrupt officials in Bosnia, trust EU officials next time when they tell them to deliver, knowing what happened to North Macedonia, what happened to Kosovo. Thank, Thank you for your question. Um, I think, Mr. Lajcek, that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you don't but trust, go somewhere that. else. If you think you have a better option, the uh, European Union is never begging anyone to, to join. I think it's the strategic choice of your guys to, to want to join the European. Let's be clear about it as a point number one. Point number two, the, the issue of visa liberalization. By the way, Anja and I were in a different panel, in a different place last week, and the foreign minister of Kosovo was with us. So there are many opportunities where we interact. Yes, it is a painful issue. The fact is that Kosovo has been left alone and the last in Europe without visa-free regime. And, uh, and the fact also is that the uh, European Commission said already in 2018 that they fulfilled the criteria. European Parliament said that they fulfilled the criteria and should get the, re the, the visa-free regime. But the body that decides is the European Council, which means 27 member states, which, de which delivers decisions on the basis of consensus. And there is no consensus. So this is what it is. Uh, I really I get slightly annoyed when I say that EU has failed and delivered on its promise. This is not about delivering. I, I, strategically, we should do better in integration. But when it comes to, to the visas, there are member states who have questions. And these questions are not of ideological nature. These questions are simply uh, related to their security, to guarantees that the visa-free regime will not be misused for illegal work, overstaying, you, know, uh, you, you name it. So that's why, instead of going around bashing the European Union for not delivering its promise, it's better to go to those member states and ask, how can we convince you? What do you want to hear from us? What guarantees should we present to make sure that once you grant the green light, it will not be misused? This is the right approach. Going around and criticizing European Union, which is now the fashion in the region, really does not help. Does not help. Ms. Leitcher, yesterday you, uh, you talked about the fact that um, there's been progress in the dialogue. There's a commitment from Serbia and Kosovo to normalize relations in a comprehensive way. I have been following your Twitter. Um, but is that simply rhetoric? Because we've been down this road before. It's a complicated situation. Um, we've had, um, you know, things happen in Washington in the last couple of years that took us nowhere. Where is it realistically, what is the expectation realistically um, for where this dialogue's headed? What does comprehensive uh, even mean it's now? It's very clear that uh, uh, the status quo that exists between Serbia and Kosovo holds the entire region back. And therefore, we need to normalize relations. And this is the process that the European Union has been facilitating. And uh, it's uh, extremely sensitive and difficult, challenging. Yesterday in Brussels, we had the first meeting between uh, President Vucic and the new Kosovo Prime Minister Kurti. It was not easy at all. But uh, what was important is that both parties committed to the process, both parties committed to the need to normalize their relations, and uh, they also committed to continue the process. 
Of course, they, their expectations from the processors are very different, and uh, it, it is an uphill battle, but it is, as I said, in the interest of the entire region in the first place, and of course in the interest of the European Union. So there is no alternative to this process, and we will continue investing time and efforts and energy into helping them to, to find the, 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 the future status of their relations that will really help to move the entire region forward. I want to get both uh, of your perspectives, and I think, uh, Mr. Uh, Minister Radman, I'd li like to start with you and also uh, the rest of you about what's going on in that region and how comprehensive relations and development can happen. So, first of all, uh, Croatia was uh, uh, the first country, and Slovenia as well, so uh, Andrzej uh, mentioned it. Uh, we are uh, published, issued a non-paper on Bosnia and Herzegovina signed by uh, five other countries. But uh, when it comes to Kosovo, um, okay, we are just in initiated under FAC uh, the comprehensive debate on Western, Western Balkans. And we uh, did actually in the uh, last, last month, and we are going also to speak uh, on, the, on another FAC uh, sometimes in, in, uh, in July. But when it comes uh, to Kosovo, uh, for the first fr time in my life as a minister, I recently visited, uh, visited Kosovo and I was impressed with the talks with, our, with the leadership in Kosovo. And uh, actually, I see that uh, I spoke to them and um, they were not so um, happy with this order first dialogue. Uh, Belgrade Pristina and then visa liberalization. So our, their proposal uh, is an, uh, first visa liberalization and we strongly support it uh, from creation point of view. They deserve it to also to, to go abroad and to, to have passports and to be uh, just to, to show them a free movement uh, uh, in the European Union. And it could just uh, relax relaxed uh, the, the better dialogue uh, between uh, uh, Belgium and, and Prishina. But even more, Croatia, uh, so also we are encouraged uh, on the FSC uh, uh, countries, you know, that so there are five countries in the European Union to not recognize the independence and sovereignty of Kosovo. I think it's the once we are uh, among the European Union, have the, the, the same approach towards Kosovo, I think so that the future of uh, Kosovo is there. Yeah, first, I would like to <clears throat> compliment on what uh, uh, Mr. Radman said that uh, uh, visa liberalization for Kosovo is important because uh, it's part of the conditionality that I was talking before. So if you say to a country that if you deliver, we will deliver, and then you fail to deliver on that, then it, cause, it has a consequences and ramifications further for the, uh, for the region. And therefore, in principle, is important without going into details who is against and who is what. But uh, in regards to the region, I would say there are two competing visions for the region. One is the European one, which means more democracy, more cooperation, more trade, more rule of law, and n less border. And the, the other vision, which is more borders, maybe optionally on an ethnic basis. And we know what this debate uh, cost us in uh, 90, 1990s. And uh, here, I don't think we should take for granted the success we have achieved. And we have achieved only because of that European perspective and the European fuel. The region that was 20 years ago in war trenches last year Within our presidency, with the Berlin process, we signed in Sofia a common regional market, a market of 18 million people without borders, without tariffs, with four freedoms included in it. And this is a huge success. So the current low point in the relations between the EU and the Western Balkans, I would try, I'm trying to see it as a segment in the relations between us. It's not a constant. Our road to EU is an irreversible process. It started in 2001, confirmed with the Saloniki pledges for uh, membership, and the association process is going, uh, is going there. It's an amplitude that we need to work on in order to continue the path. We had one more question uh, from the audience. Could you make it very quick and to whom you're addressing it to as well? 
We only have about five minutes left. Thank you. Uh, it's a very precise question for Minister Osmani. Minister Osmani, if the EU tomorrow offered uh, North Macedonia to sign an accession treaty within a period of five years, an accession treaty which would, for a temporary period, uh, ensure, uh, grant North Macedonia membership, but membership with some reduced rights, reduced rights in a temporary, like, let's say, with some derogations and uh, provisions for uh, more gradual accession over time, with post-membership uh, conditionalities, clear conditionalities for North Macedonia to enter deeper uh, layers of membership. Would you be uh, against or for that? This is a very sensitive debate since if I say yes, that would mean that we are quitting our ambition for full membership. But I will be, on, uh, I will be honest with you. It's not the main most important priority of the citizens of the Western Balkan to have a commissioner in EU Commission, or to have an e, uh, more EU parliamentarians, or to have a right to veto EU foreign policies. Their ambition is to have access to responsibilities and privileges of the common market, of the for freedom, to have access to, uh, to sustainable grants, to have access to uh, to cheap loans, development loans, in order to improve their living standard, to have the opportunity to travel freely, to educate uh, uh, their children in e EU countries. And I think this is the first and foremost ambitions that we need to work on. The new methodology envisages this uh, opportunity, that there will be a phase in uh, access to different programs of, of EU, as long as you meet certain criteria, you close some chapters or, uh, or clusters. But it's important to start the process. The problem here with the credibility is because of the symbolism of not moving forward. And I said at the beginning, I know that we will not join EU soon, and maybe not even in this, in this setting. The problem is that the symb symbolic that has created the uh, uh, dossier of North Macedonia by waiting 16 years just to start the process, it's hitting hardly the credibility of the process and credibility is the fuel and credibility is the glue that I was talking about. That brings me to my final question to all of you because we have run out of time. Um, at times when you look at the region, you think that we are looking at a 1990s problem with a 1990s mindset looking for 1990s solutions. This is 2021. Um, we are still talking about redrawing borders uh, in terms of some papers that came out. We're talking about concerns about rule of law that you have all brought up. We are talking about uh, numbers where uh, polls have suggested that many people within the region prefer an autocratic system of government, uh, governance rather than democratic, which leads to a gap in EU value systems and what's going on in the region. From your perspective, um, do we need a new 2021 or 2020s um, way of approaching the region and how we resolve the issues to finally say we can put the past in the past? Mr. Lajcik, you want to start? Yes, I think we need this new approach because the fact is that nowadays we have problem to adopt the same language that we adopted 15 years ago. Uh, that means we are not moving in the right direction. We also need to uh, see the big picture. As I said, we are lost in, uh, in this bureaucratic language, in chapters and clusters and corruption and rule of law, and we don't see people. We don't see people's hopes and the hopes that are linked to European Union. We don't see the picture of a European continent with Western Balkans being part of us, mm -hmm. of our value system, or Europe with Western Balkans would be part of a different system. What would it mean for us? And as I already said in my first uh, uh, entry, that we also don't see the region as a part of our own demonstration of ability to, to be a global player. So this is, uh, this is missing in our discussion. So, uh, it is first and foremost a political process. Yep. And, we, and we must not get lost in technicalities of this political process. 
Uh, well, I've been told that we're running out of time, so very, very quickly, if I can get in a sentence quickly, what you, what each one of you thinks is a 2020 solution to this issue to move it along quickly. Well, it's our presidency. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we will do our utmost, but as I said, this is the problem of 27 member states, and as well. Uh, it's a green light from all of us to, to proceed. So I think we just need to move forward. When we move forward one or the other way, I think that we'll go through the, to the final line. Mr. Adman? Yeah, we support the EU presidency of Slovenia as our uh, uh, neighbor, of course. But uh, so uh, we have to have, uh, you know, there are six countries, there are different countries, and we have to uh, separately appro approach towards each, each country. First of all, uh, territorial in integrity in the region is very, very important. It, it must be preserved and, and protected. Uh, secondly, our junior reconciliation in the region is very, very important, just in to our, uh, it, it must be somehow established. And Bosnia and Herzegovina, mm -hmm. we, we, we haven't spoke on, on this issue. It's very, it's multi ethnic society. That would take three hours. And, and so. stable in institution for, for functional Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, uh, deserves also our uh, uh, attention when it comes to the constitutional or uh, actually equality of the three constituent people uh, based on the Dayton Parish Agreement and Constitution as well. Minister Smani. Final word, final sentence. North Macedonia, there was a comparative analysis by EU on uh, take stock in the, the situation with all Western Balkan countries. North Macedonia is first in the region in meeting political criteria, in meeting economic criteria. 40% 40 40 of the EU acquis is already transposed in our domestic legislation. 94% alignment with EU common foreign security policy. The timing is now to start the accession talk and 2021 should be the answer to it. We hope during the Portuguese presidency, just next week in Tuesday, mm -hmm. if not, we support Slovenian presidency. Well, that's a good note to end on. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Please give a round of applause to a difficult conversation done in 55 minutes. <laughs>